on the Trip to Canadian Matters Tour for, uh, for Elizabeth May. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 4 territory today. Uh, as we should all remember uh, that this land has uh, been is being shared with us and has uh, been very graciously that, uh, that we are able to be here. Uh, so, uh, with no further ado, I want to get into uh, an introduction of Elizabeth May here. And uh, so I'll just maybe give a little little background here and I'll try not to go too long on, on all the things that she has done. But uh, I'll just give a little bit here. So, uh, Elizabeth May has a long record as a committed advocate for social justice, for the environment, for human rights, and for economic pragmatic, pragmatic solutions. She's an environmentalist, a writer, activist, and lawyer who has been active in the environmental movement since 1970. She first became known in the Canadian media in the mid-1970s through her leadership as a volunteer in the grassroots movement against proposed aerial insecticide spraying on forests near her home on Cape Breton, Iowa, in Nova Scotia. The effort prevented aerial insecticide spraying from ever occurring in Nova Scotia. Uh, to go over some of her volunteer work, her volunteer work also includes uh, successful campaigns to uh, prevent the approval of uranium mining in Nova Scotia and extensive work on energy policy issues, primarily opposing nuclear energy. She has had, held the position of uh, Associate General Counsel for Public Interest Advocacy Center, representing consumer, poverty, and environment, environment groups from 1905 to 1986. She has worked extensively with Indigenous peoples internationally, particularly in the Amazon, as well as with Canadian First Nations. She was the first volunteer executive director of Cultural Survival Canada from 1999 to 1992, and worked for the Algonquin of Marier Lake from 1991 to 1992. She has taught courses at Queen's University School of Policy Studies, as well as teaching for a year at Dalhousie University to develop the program established in her name in Women's Health and Environment. Uh, she holds three honorary doctorates from Mount St. Vincent University, Mount Allison, and the University of New Brunswick. May is taught, Elizabeth May is also the author of eight books. Uh, Bugs and Battles, uh, Frederick Street, Life and Death on Canada's Love Canal, At the Cutting Edge, The Crisis in Canada's Forests, How to Save the World in Your Spare Time, Global Warming for Dummies, Losing <laughs> Confidence, Power Politics and Crisis in Canadian Democracy, Who We Are, Reflections on My Life in Canada. And in 2005, she was also named an officer of the Order of Canada. And in November 2010, Newsweek magazine named her one of the world's most influential women. In the 2011 election, May made history by being the first Green Party candidate to be elected to the House of Commons. She now represents. <laughs> so she now represents the riding of Saanich Gulf Islands. So without any further ado, here is Elizabeth May, the leader of the Green Party of Canada, a member of Parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands, to speak on our community management. I don't think Larry Newfield introduced himself, but he is the, uh, this is elections act talk. You, have, you can't get, I mean, if it was Greens, we'd say the grassroots convener or something, but we have operated under elections act rules, and that's why he is the CEO of the EDA for, uh, for the Greens in Regina, uh, Louisville. So I'm very, very grateful to him for such a generous introduction and all the work that was done by Larry and other volunteers in the Green Party to help organize tonight here in Regina and other activities while I'm here in Regina. So this is a Community Matters tour, and that is a, a play on words a bit, because in the Green Party, for us, communities matter. Uh, a healthy community, a community where people know their neighbors, where they're there to give each other a hand in bad times. Communities are the backbone of this country and make a big difference, whether it's a smaller neighborhood that can be found where people know each other within a big city or a small town 
we're getting, before the election campaign begins, before we're in earnest out on the hustings, uh, the Green Party's idea was to get to every province, and uh, I'm hoping two out of three territories, I'm hoping it's expensive to fly the territories, but we're trying to get to every province, to multiple communities within each province, and to ask what matters to you, and to listen, and take that information on board, take it back to the preparation of the Green Party of Canada's election platform for 2019, have it be relevant so that people, whether you're living in uh, rural and remote parts of Canada or downtown urban areas, whether you're a farmer or whether you're struggling to find work, want to be able to have people look at our platform and think, Oh, that's a really good idea. I'm glad someone's heard me. So that's the goal of the way we've organized the Community Matters Tour. Uh, this, the trip is, of course, given our overwhelming sense of urgency around the climate crisis, uh, we've organized this tour to be as low carbon as possible. So we started with the parliamentary break that took place as a week in February, taking the train from Ottawa, going to Montreal and Quebec City, and then the train from Montreal to Moncton, New Brunswick, and that became the jumping off place for uh, as low carbon travel as we could to Prince Edward Island, to New Brunswick, to Nova Scotia. And then this leg of the trip, I left Vancouver by Via Rail March 1st, and we popped off in uh, the areas where we don't necessarily, I know we won't necessarily get back to some of these communities during the <coughs> National Leaders Tour, but we had town hall meetings in a town as small as Ashcroft that has 1,400 people, as well as Prince George, as well as Kamloops, then Edmonton, then Calgary, then Saskatoon, and today Regina, going on to events in Manitoba, and then so on and so forth. So I won't go on with the whole itinerary, but the goal is to get to as many communities as possible and listen to people and hear their ideas. Now, I, I, I'm really grateful to be Saskatchewan has played a big part in my life. I don't know how many of you know that. When Larry was going over sort of my, my life history of my work in the environmental movement, uh, in 1986, I went to work for the Federal Minister of Environment in the Mulroney administration, although I wasn't a member of any party at all. But they, I was an environmental lawyer, and the Minister of Environment wanted me in his office. And I don't know how many of you remember the whole story of the Rafferty Alameda dams and why I resigned on principle and left that job. But some of you are not, yes, so some of us have been around a while. But uh, <laughs> that campaign, and, well, of course, I was listening to the people who were fighting the Rafferty Alameda Dam had come to meet with me as the minister's senior policy advisor, and I promised them that nothing would happen until there was an environmental assessment. And then suddenly the dams were approved without any environmental assessment. So I, I stepped down from my job, and that was that. But I can tell you, every single day, as a member of Parliament, I have counted my lucky stars that I had the experience of working in Ottawa for a Minister of Environment when government worked, I have to say, pretty well. I mean, it was it was bad when my boss broke the law to give the permits to the Rafferty and Alameda dams. That was definitely a, a low point. But uh, and it was it was somewhat it was a bit extraordinary that the issue over which I resigned my position ended up in federal court, and the federal court of appeal, you know, they didn't mention me, but they said yeah, this these permits are illegal. That's a quite nice vindication if you've lost your job thinking something's wrong. So I was um, at that point. The permits were quashed to the order of what happened. Then they set up the environmental assessment panel and they ran roughshod over that, etc. But the two years I had from 1986 to 1988, I had a couple of things that were extraordinary. And one of them comes back to me all the time now that we're going through this SNC Lavalin experience of boy, oh boy, our senior bureaucrats back in the day really knew their stuff. And you'd never have had a clerk of Privy Council calling a Minister of Justice and sort of on a shakedown effort. To, you know, intimidation was not as really... So I know how government works when it works well, because I've seen it. And I also had the enormous advantage in 1986 uh, of joining the Office of the Minister of Environment when we were in the midst of doing things that mattered, where political courage mattered. So it, it wasn't an issue that affected Saskatchewan, but the fight against acid rain 
meant that Prime Minister Brian Mulroney had to take on Ronald Reagan on a pollution issue that was killing lakes and streams in eastern Canada and, and hurting our forests at a time when Ronald Reagan believed that acid rain was caused by ducks. <laughs> so, and, and uh, if you cast your mind back to Brian Mulroney, I know that it's the rare Canadian who has warm, fuzzy thoughts. But Brian Mulroney was very serious about acid rain. And he made it the number one top bilateral issue every time he sat down with the President of the United States before they could talk about anything else, and by the way, this is when they were negotiating the free trade agreement, before they could talk about anything else, they had to talk about acid rain. The, uh, Mulroney was relentless. And he finally got Ronald Reagan, not on the basis of the science. It was finally on the basis of Ronald Reagan saying to his staff, oh, we really ought to do something for Brian. He's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> that acid rain thing, we'll do that for him. <laughs> and then, of course, Canada didn't go to the United States to ask them to act on acid rain until we cleaned up our own act. It was a very different kind of an ethic. With, okay, if we're going to ask the United States, and in those days, they, half of all the acid rain that fell on Canada came from the United States, primarily from the coal burning areas of Ohio. And half of the acid rain that fell on the United States came from Canada, primarily from the Eco Smelter in Ontario, which was the single largest point source of acid rain. And this is the kind of thing, again, the, the senior civil service in those days had depth of knowledge and was well informed and creative and, and what, brilliant policy wonk people. But so too did we have political leadership that was prepared to show some backbone. So in the case of acid rain, and I've been reminiscing about this a, a bit lately, in the case of acid rain, the, uh, first of all, you had to have the leadership from the Prime Minister, and then we negotiated one at a time with each of the seven eastern provinces to get reductions in, in sulfur dioxide pollution that turned into acid rain. So what we did was started with the easy ones and worked our way up to the hardest. And the hardest, of course, was Ontario, because Eco was the number one point source polluter in North America for acid rain. And the environment minister for Ontario, his name was Jim Bradley, he only recently re retired, I think this was 1985, 6, 87. Anyway, Jim Bradley told Inco, you're gonna have to cut your pollution by one half. And they said, if you make us do that, we'll close down and everybody got to work and we'll all blame you. Does that sound familiar? So, <laughs> I'm Jim Bradley, said, well, I don't think you will, you know, I have a lot of confidence that you'll figure it out. So they went over his head and they went to the Premier of Ontario, David Peterson, and they said to him, you've got to fire that crackpot environment these reviewers. He will cause us to close. Thousands of people will lose their jobs. Uh, it, you can't shut down the eco smelter, and that's what will happen if you make us reduce pollution by 50%. And Premier David Peterson smiled sweetly and said, oh, I don't think that will happen. I bet you can manage it. I bet you can figure it out. Now, in the end, and my experience over decades of dealing with issues like this, is that large industry starts by saying, we're not the source of the problem, there is no problem, then they move to, there may be a problem, but it's not us, <laughs> then they move to, okay, it's a problem, it is us, but it'll cost too much for us to clean it up, so, you know, we won't do it. And then when they finally, if, if political courage holds fast, and if politicians have a backbone, then what happens is the industry adjusts and makes more money than ever. Inevitably, every time. So in the case of Inco, they ended up putting smelters on the stacks at the smelter. They collected the sulfur and they sold it and they made more money than ever. They never, they, they, yeah. So that's, that was my experience of the 80s and how things worked. So showing up in the minister's office, the first issue we dealt with was acid rain and we fixed it. The next issue we dealt with was the threat to the ozone layer and Canada showed global leadership. We negotiated something called the Montreal Protocol in 1987 that protected the ozone layer and to this day is the most effective global treaty on almost any topic, but certainly the most effective global environmental treaty we've ever had. Canada was in the lead. We did it, by the way, DuPont, same pattern. The ozone layer isn't thinning. The instruments are wrong. Okay, well, the ozone layer is thinning, but it's not our fault. 
okay, the ozone layer is thinning, it is our fault, but it will cost too much to fix it, to finally, oh, you're serious? Okay, we found an alternative and we cornered the market, so we're good. <laughs> um, in the case of climate crisis and fossil fuel lobby was a shock, but back to when I was working in government, I was so fortunate that I learned all my climate science from Environment Canada scientists before the myth of doubt was invented. Yeah. Nobody thought there was a debate about burning fossil fuels, releases to greenhouse gases, it could disrupt the climate. That wasn't debated when I worked in government. So fast forward to now, and we are in a climate emergency where between 1988, when Canada was in the lead, to 1992, when Canada was still in the lead and the uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed by all nations on Earth at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 92. From 92 till now, we're, we've actually procrastinated to such an extent that more greenhouse gases have been emitted since we signed the treaty at the Rio Earth Summit to now than had occurred between the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the Rio Earth Summit. So that's a statement about political failure, whereas the first stories of acid rain and ozone inflation were stories of, of leadership and courage. Uh, we seem to have lost all courage in the intervening years of the 90s. A quick analysis that I've shared before moving on to what I also wanted to talk to you about tonight, mostly wanted to talk to you about tonight, but what the heck happened in the 1990s was the end of the Uruguay round the creation of the World Trade Organization, and essentially the ascendancy of, of, of two things, as the Berlin Wall collapsed and the USSR fell apart. We had the ascendancy of neoliberalism and the notion that capitalism had vanquished the USSR, and instead of having a peace dividend that we'd all expected once we were no longer in an arms race, we just kind of blew it in global casinos created through the WTO, and we allowed ourselves to no longer pay attention to uh, fundamental threats because increasingly through that period, starting in the early 90s and accelerating, we've seen corporations take over governments. And it hasn't just happened here, and it's not just one province, and it's not just Canada, it's kind of everywhere. And global corporate rule has diminished the powers of governments around the world, and global corporate rule has in a sense, uh, it's corroded fundamental democracies, but it's been accompanied by great wealth, a consumer economy, lots of material wealth that have created distractions and addictions that have kept people from paying attention to what happened to our democracies, why do citizens no longer feel in control, what's going on here? So in the next election campaign, I'm gonna try to campaign to win a lot of seats for Green MPs across Canada by trying to tell the truth all the time about everything I'm seeing, including saying our regulators are captive of the industries they regulate, including saying we've got to act seriously about the climate crisis. We can't afford to have incremental changes around the margins. We're actually going to have to make massive leaps into what will actually be a great future where things are better and there's more employment than now and we don't have to use fuels that kill us in order to keep our lights on and keep people employed. But I have to talk about these things honestly without acting, without making it appear to people or people feel fearful. Now when you talk about the climate catastrophe and where we're headed if we don't hold to global average temperature increases of no more than are advised by the world scientists, it can feel scary and the people who understand the issue best are the ones who can do the most to change things, but are often overwhelmed by a sense of personal uh, impotence politically as well as despair over how bad things are. So we have to kind of pull ourselves up for our bootstraps, those of us who understand climate science, address it confidently with a whole pile of solutions, and engage other Canadians to join in with us. And that's, that's going to be an exciting time of telling people there is a really good future ahead. Join us so we can get there together. It's also going to be a campaign where we want to talk about the need for pharmacare, universal coverage for pharmacare as the next element of our social safety net. We want to talk about the elimination of poverty in Canada through guaranteed livable income. That's another essential element 
of our social safety net. We want to talk about making the world fair for young people. I see a number of young people in the audience here. I'm really pleased. But we know that, that compared to when I left university, young people leaving university today are burdened with student debts that we would never have imagined, with interest payments on those debts, and looking at an economy where the chances of finding a really good job that meet the skills they've just learned in university seem pretty daunting. The ability to, have, it's not quite as big a debt problem in Saskatchewan. I was just earlier today uh, at the checkout at um, Hunter Gatherer, I recognized the young woman at the checkout. She's not here tonight. She, I told her she should come, but she has a second job, so she's to make it. Anyway, I read it. She, she waited on me at a table at a really good organic restaurant in Vancouver. <laughs> and she said, yeah, got priced out of Vancouver, couldn't afford to live there, came home to Regina. So I know from her that access to affordable housing isn't the same kind of crisis in Regina that it is in Vancouver. But for young people who thought of buying your own home, Starting out in life with a, a good chance of a foundation on which you build your life is harder for this generation of millennials than it ever was for certainly for boomers. Boomers, I'm, I was born in 1954, so I'm part of the generation that had it easy. That you know, kind of run up a whole lot of credit card debt and figure our kids will handle it. Um, we have to be fair to the younger generation and abolish tuition, yeah. adequately fund universities so everybody. Has the whole range of issues we're going to talk about in the election campaign. And, if, and I'd say if there's three fundamental pieces to where we're going with what we want to talk about in the next campaign, it'll be climate, democracy, and justice in around issues around truth and reconciliation. So really being serious about uh, the injustices of the last 150 years to the people on whose territory we live and really making it right, which is not so much about work that indigenous people have to do, but much more about work that separate culture Canadians have to do. So I get excited about it. I think it's going to be fun. One reason it's so much fun, I have to tell you, I'm sure you've noticed it, and I don't know if it struck you as good news, but Maxine Bernier makes me so happy. <laughs> and, um, he is my seatmate. We sit together. <laughs> and journalists are always asking me, how come you and Max get along so well? And I said, well, we, we don't agree on anything. <laughs> he's, he's, I have to say, he's a very um, courteous, thoughtful person, so that's a nice person to sit next to. And I help him out as much as I can because, well, if you're in one of the big parties, this isn't a slide against Max, but honest to God, if you're in one of the big parties, you, and no matter how long you've been in Parliament, you won't have a clue what the rules are. Be, because your party tells you. That's how it's organized. This is true for conservatives, liberals, new Democrats. The party tells you what the rules are, what to do, how to vote. So that's what happens. I think it's a, we, I, it's, but anyway, Max uh, and I are, are very happy about one thing in, on which we agree which is that he will split the conservative vote. <laughs> and he's, he's happy about it, and I'm happy about it. I don't know if Andrew Shear is happy about it. <laughs> When I, was stuff, when I was campaigning in Halifax, someone had saved me a clipping. Max's speech in Halifax had been about how well he gets along with Elizabeth May. They were the great part. It's like, okay, it's a little weird. <laughs> but the, 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 this election would go into it with a very different set of dynamics than in 2015. Stephen Harper is gone, and as much as I don't, you know, I, and it's not personal with Andrew, I know him quite well. I just don't think he should be prime minister. And he's actually unfit to govern. But that's primarily because he persists in not understanding climate as an issue. And I, he's smart enough to understand it. He doesn't want to. So there's Andrew, there's Max, and then we have the massive numbers of disillusioned people who voted liberal to ensure that 2015, the last election held under first past the post, disillusioned because they were told we're going to see real climate leadership now. I could go on. And then there's the NDP, which I think through 
bad luck more than anything. And I, and I, I like Germany. Uh, we, we, have, we, have, we don't know each other that well yet, but I have to say we have a very good, respectful, and courteous relationship. But it's very clear that they're going to do badly in the next election. And the result is, and this part's the really good news, I think a very strong likelihood is that at the end of the next election, for sure, there will be members of parliament elected from six parties. Now that's going to be unusual, because I've mentioned the five, but of course in Quebec, there will be blocked Quebec law members elected. So there will be six parties in the House of Commons. It's extremely likely that no one party will have the majority of seats, despite the perversity of first past the post, where you only need to have 35, 39% of the vote to get a false majority. This time around, there's a much stronger likelihood that it will be a minority parliament where we all have to work together. And the last time we had a minority parliament, and this is another Saskatchewan story, was in the late, in the 1960s. Oh, we, of course, and that's not true the last time. The last time we had an effective parliament. Was <laughs> uh, Stephen Harper had a minority, but he managed to, ex he, Stephen Harper was, in terms of uh, sort of chess player, strategist, genius, quite true. I don't know, yeah, cunning, true, in that he invented the omnibus budget bill so that he could, in a minority parliament, have complete control and not have to negotiate with the other parties to get support to get through budgets. Because he could get a budget passed and because none of the other parties were ready to go to an election yet. So other parties wouldn't Push, they wouldn't, unfortunately, the Liberals and the NDP refused to work together in 2005, so Harper was in a minority, had the powers as if he had a majority. Because any piece of legislation that was really unpalatable could never have passed the legislation he passed that was, that you could, if it wasn't attached to a confidence motion, so I'm saying, if it wasn't a budget measure, the majority of MPs would never have allowed the destruction of a lot of environmental laws. But once it was put in a budget bill, they didn't want to go to an election yet, not because on principle they had any problem with defeating the Harper administration, but because the backroom people who run the parties didn't want to go to the polls yet because they hadn't raised enough money yet. So they wanted a nice bit of time between elections to see if they can get the coffers full again before they run again. So back to the last minority parliament that actually worked in the public interest and worked well, having covered off what Harper did in minority to run as if he had a majority, was the government of Lester B. Pearson. So you have to go all the way back to the 1960s when we had a minority parliament that is what I want to see revisited in our next parliament in 2019, 2020, 21, 22, 23. And that is a minority parliament which survives because good people are prepared to compromise and work together. So in the case of Lester B. Pearson's minority parliament, Lester B. Pearson had more seats than the Conservatives, but not a majority. The official opposition, John Diefenbaker, and 17 members of parliament from a much smaller party under the leadership of Tony Douglas. And that's why we have our health care system. In one parliament, in the minority parliament in the late 19th we got universal health care and the Canada Health Act. We got the Canada Pension Plan. We got our pension system so that the seniors didn't spend their, their our, now that I'm a senior, end of lifetime in, in poverty. We got unemployment insurance. And we got student loans but without interest payments. That was in one parliament with a minority but where the 17 New Democrats, including David Lewis, Stephen Lewis's father, Abby Lewis's grandfather, we could go on. <laughs> but that parliament is a precursor to what I hope we can do after this election. We don't want a majority. We want a minority parliament where good people will work together and we can lay down those next pieces of the social safety net. Pharmacare, guaranteeable income, a really meaningful climate plan that ensures everyone has the kind of job that we want, but at the same time, moves away from fossil fuels as rapidly as possible. So that's why I'm happy to be talking to people now, in March 2019, 
about why I'm hoping when you go to the polls in October 2019, you give serious thought to doing something you may have never done before, and that's cast your ballot for a Green Party candidate to be your member of parliament. And I promise at least you won't suffer the side effects of strategic voting, which involve reading the polls feeling a little ill. This way, breathe deeply and smile and vote for what you want. So thank you, and I'm going to open up these microphones.